Yes. Marty Mack. It's on me because I let the mother, I had it laying right on my ball. It's okay. It's, it's funny because every time I show, like, next time, next time you won't catch me, when I'll get you. When will we see that lieutenant again? I'm going to go and see him at work because i got to talk to his boss soon, okay. so I'll just take him up there. Yeah. It's, uh, it is laughable. How many when times it, when are you going to this, this ball? I'll just drive over there Monday or Tuesday. Just let me go. Let me know when you're going. You good? No. It'll be all good. Because I've got to get rid of mine, too.
prediction. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the ceremony will begin in five minutes. I'd ask that you please silence any cell phones. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the spring 2022 Maranatha Baptist University Army Reserve Officers Training Corps Commissioning Ceremony. I'm Major Michael Santola, your MC for today's event. Today's ceremony is the culmination of a long journey for these three cadets who are about to be commissioned as officers in our nation's army. Please feel free to move about during the ceremony if you desire to take pictures. Ladies and gentlemen, Please rise for the national anthem. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain standing for the invocation from Dr. Marriott. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for government. We know the government has been ordained for good. And Lord, we have been particularly blessed in the United States of America to have a government that is a protector and defender of inalienable rights that you have given us. We thank you that this country has been generous in extending that protection around the world at times. And Lord, thank you for using the United States military uh, to accomplish that great end. 
Thank you, Lord, for these cadets. Thank you for raising them up and giving them a heart, not only for you, uh, but for their country. I pray that you would use them in the defense of our Constitution and our Republic. I pray, God, that they would be protected in all that they do, that you would place them uh, in service and placements in the military where they could be the most effective. And as we pray for all graduates, that you would put them in strategic places. I pray as uh, they raise families and, and uh, Lord, uh, model Christianity and Christ to uh, their fellow soldiers, I pray that you would use them for your glory to that end as well. Lord, thank you for the privilege of having ROTC at Maranatha for these years. And uh, Lord, if it please you, we pray that you could restore that uh, in the years ahead. Thank you for the men in military that stand uh, here today, all that they represent. And uh, thank you, Lord, for the mentoring uh, that these men, these cadets have received and what they will receive from these and others. May this uh, gathering today uh, bring you glory in every way and we'll thank you in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Please be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our official party. First, Lieutenant Colonel Stanley Johnson IV, Professor of Military Science at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and Master Sergeant Jeffrey Campbell, the University of Wisconsin-Madison Senior Military Instructor. <clears throat> And now it is my honor to introduce some of the, this afternoon's distinguished guests. Dr. Matt Davis, the Chief Executive Officer of Maranatha Baptist University. Dr. Marty Marriott, President of Maranatha Baptist University. Dr. Tracy Foster, Dean of the School of Business. And Dr. Jeffrey Drost, Drost uh, Professor. Thank you everybody for being here with us today. I would like to introduce the Professor of Military Science, Lieutenant Colonel Stanley Johnson. Thank you, Major Santola. Hey, this is a great day, all right? So let's, let's not be crazy and stand on ceremony and sit back or be quiet when we're, we're feeling awkward. At any point in time when you folks feel like coming up to take a picture, please do. Don't, don't worry about, you know, I should be in the back or standing up a little bit. Come on up here, get your, get your pictures. It's a great day for these three young men up on the stage and obviously for you as the family members, instructors, and, and mentors who've pushed these people along to get to this point. So please take advantage of that and come up and, and be a part of the ceremony when the, when the time is appropriate. Um, I can't possibly get through this today without making a comment about Cadet Elms' hair. I, I had a comment in here. <laughs> For nine months, I would see him on the, the video screens and he would have just this most amazing hair and then today he just came completely regular. He totally got, <laughs> he got inside my head on this one big time. So this, <laughs> there's this much I was gonna say that I'm just skipping over. You got me today, <laughs> definitely did. Um, as you all know, this is the last uh, commissioning ceremony, at least for the foreseeable future, here at Maranatha Baptist. Um, and this last commissioning class that'll come out of this fine institution for, for a little while, to, to say the least. Um, I just want to take a moment before we introduce our, our guest speaker uh, to thank the fine instructors uh, that are in attendance today, my cadre who have helped to, to mentor these folks along the way, to include uh, Sergeant First Class Luciano, retired, who came up to, to watch the ceremony. There he is over there. Um, I think that's great that you were able to come in here today. And also the, uh, the family members who've put the time into shaping these three young men. So give, give yourselves a round of applause. <laughs> so I kind of get the day off on giving the long spiel today, so, so thank you for that. Let me uh, introduce our guest speaker. Um, Dean of the Maranatha School of Business, Dr. Tracy Foster, before joining the faculty. He served in the U.S. Army as a military intelligence officer, finance officer instructor, and financial analyst and comptroller. A few deployments under his belt, uh, twice to Afghanistan and once to Kuwait as well. Upon returning from Afghanistan, Dr. Foster was fortunate enough to work in the Defense Financial Analyst uh, Office for the Joint Chiefs of Staff, which is a pretty lofty position at the Pentagon. Then came to Maranatha in 2012, unless I'm mistaken. Um, has also worked at Motorola and has been a financial analyst there and then been a manager in the retail food industry. 
Um, tracking from your bio that you, you consider Montana to be your, your home out there, your, your favorite place. Um, you remain active by biking. Love spending time with your 16 grandchildren. Amazing, congratulations. Uh, you and your wife, Laura, have two daughters, Rebecca and Jalen. With that, Dr. Foster, I'll let you take it away. All right, thank you very much. Um, and thank you all for coming today. This is uh, quite a crowd. And it's uh, quite a testament. Uh, I'm not sure all the reasons why we're three guys could come here. All, you're all here, but I'm glad you're here. It does speak very highly um, uh, for them as well as everything that's gone into this point in time. So it's certainly a very special and unique uh, event in their lives. Uh, you know, this today is uh, <laughs> it's a very busy day for them, obviously, but it's also this particular event right now is in some ways a lot like commencement. Uh, in that it's not so much a celebration uh, or a recognition of past events, although that's true. It's really more about a look forward, and it's hence the commencement is the commencing your stepping out. And in a similar kind of way, as far as the commissioning goes, I think of, uh, although I'm certainly not a Navy person, unlike Dr. Drost here, who, uh, but I know enough about ships to know that they commission them and they launch them out into the deep. And a ship that's sitting in dry dock is not worth anything. It's got to be launched down in the deep for it to accomplish its mission and purpose that it was designed for. And in the same kind of way, these guys are being commissioned and launched out into the deep, so to speak, uh, to accomplish their purpose and their mission. And um, as they, as God allows, they, they get promoted, they do their job, right? <laughs> At every, almost every promotion that I had, it was always emphasized that those promotions were not so much about what had been done Although certainly that's true, it was about the potential and the confidence as them and leaders in the days to come. So it was about what they were going to do, not what they've already done. And so again, this, this is just the first of many uh, as God wills for you to do that. So I want to speak to you primarily, although you can all listen in if you like, <laughs> about priorities. And um, you know, it's, it's such an exciting time. It's, this brings back memories. I mean, almost literally to the day 30, day, 30 years ago, it's kind of scary to think that, I was in the same place as you are right now. Uh, I was getting commissioned in Montana State University, Billings, Montana. Uh, just come out of the four years of RTC program there. Uh, it was a fairly small unit, just like it is here. A very small ROTC program. And within probably one year, maybe two max, that I was done with my commissioning, that program was ended there. And so <laughs> it's, uh, there's a lot of you know, memories and uh, you know, kind of bittersweet time, just like it was then. So what's kind of interesting is that there are a lot of similarities between what happened then with me and that program that was happening here at Maranatha Baptist University now with our ROTC program. Because these decisions are not made lightly. Uh, I can guarantee that. Uh, the decision to bring RTC here was, there was a lot of uh, certainly prayer and work that went into getting it here, and there was also a lot of work that made the program decide to go away. Um, and just like it did back then. In fact, uh, I want to give you guys a really quick military history lesson, if you're okay with that. <laughs> you probably had enough military history, but I'm going to give you just a little bit more. <laughs> and I can do so because I'm part of that history, okay? So <laughs> it's personal for me. We had just, in, and this was in 1992, mind you, uh, we had just been through in the Army in the 80s going from 18 active duty divisions down to 10. Think about that, that's almost cut in half. Why would the Army choose to do something like that? It just seems crazy, right? And why would we cut programs like an Army RC program? Well, the answer is, Resources, limited resources. We can't do everything. And so tough decisions had to be made to be prioritized things. And so, you know, it's, it was a time during the 80s, uh, and of course I wouldn't expect most of you in the room <laughs> to remember this, but it was a very difficult time in the Army as we were transitioning out of Vietnam era. Uh, we had a large force, but it was not equipped very well, and there was some training issues, there was force readiness issues, and of course we had Interestingly, a lot like there's a lot of similarities between what's going on today and what was going on uh, 30, 40 years ago. Because we had this thing called the Soviet Union that we were very concerned about. And <laughs> it almost seems strange to even say that. That's why we call it for a while the FSU, the former Soviet Union. But we were trying to have a 
force that would be able to reckon not only the Soviet Union, but all the other threats that were out there in the world. And so we had to make tough decisions about limited resources. We just can't do it all. So there was a decision made intentionally to reduce the force structure from 18 to 10 active duty divisions, take that savings and invest it in the very things that if I start to make, make mention of a few things, you're gonna realize, oh, that's why we got that. Like for instance, the Apache helicopter, the M1 Abrams tank, the M2 Bradley. Those are just a few of the weapon systems that the Army put a lot of time, money, and effort into to develop and to equip so that we had a modern force. We realized we were falling behind in terms of uh, um, technology behind our th major threats. And so the point was that just like then, they had to make a tough decision about do we have a large force or do we have a smaller, very well-equipped and trained force? And the decision was to make a smaller, well-equipped, trained force. So let's fast forward, okay? <laughs> so where are we at today? You know, we've just come out of something very similar. We've come out of, you know, I've kind of lost count, uh, over 10 years worth of, you know, war in Afghanistan, Iraq. And so where are we at now? I mean, we've got a lot of threats out there, right? <laughs> threats and potential threats. What do we choose to do? Do we have a large force that can deal with all of them simultaneously? That's, we don't have the time, the money, the effort to do it all. So that's, again, this is just one example, one small example of the result of tough decisions that have to be made. And it's all about a prioritization. So kind of getting to something a little more personal for me, uh, all through my time, most of my time in the military, I was involved in resource management, budgeting, prioritizing, programming. And we had a process called the Planning, Programming, Budgeting, Execution Process, the PPBE. And uh, so in one way or another, I was involved in this quite a bit but it really kind of culminated with a joint staff where we were analyzing budgets, you know, $650 billion to try to figure out where the money should go and what's the most important things. And it was a constant battle trying to advise senior leadership on where the money should go. How do you suppose that they figure out where all these, this money should go? Well, the answer is you start with the most important things, right? It starts with the P in the PPE process, which is planning. And you take the, the national security strategy, and I'm not gonna, don't worry, I'm not gonna get into all the details of what that looks like, but the point is, is that you have a strategy and a priority that's already been set. What is your mission? What's your purpose in life? And then that's going to drive and determine what all your resources and your requirements are in terms of people, equipment, training, all that's gonna get defined by that. But all those tough decisions that have to be made are set primarily through what your mission and your purpose is. And it, in terms of the national level, it's the national security strategy, all right? And then it eventually gets down to the dollars and it turns into a budget. I, uh, during my time on the joint staff, uh, just before I left, uh, we were going through a pretty significant budget drill. It was a hypothetical at the time, ironically. And uh, it was this thing called sequestration. <laughs> And there might be a handful of you in the room that actually know what that term, that we know what that term is and what it means. Uh, kind of a very strange thing, and what's that have to do with you guys right now? Well, what happened was that there was, that Congress had kind of built in a mechanism that if there wasn't a decision made on, uh, on some financial matters that was going to be an automatic across the board cut, across everything. And the funny thing was at the time, we just, we were kind of almost half laughing at this thing. This, this would never happen. <laughs> but we're gonna go through the process of saying, well, what if it did happen? What would be the worst things would happen? So we had gone through a series of budget drills and um, we recommended the senior leadership, well, here's what would happen, here's what would get cut. And, uh, but the funny thing was, fast forward a few months, I'm here at Maranatha, and in early 2013, I get a letter well, I didn't personally get the letter. I downloaded the letter that was signed by General Odierno, who's the Chief Staff of the Army at the time and the Secretary of the Army. And he says, your rare sequestration went into effect. <laughs> oh, how about that? This, was, this is to all uh, leaders in the military. And he goes on to talk about how there's been this uh, challenge of lack of predictability, flexibility in the budget cycle, a series of budget cuts. And it's sounding familiar because trust me, we're at a point now where we're really, there's a lot of fiscal, there's a lot of fiscal pressure to cut a lot in not only just the military, but the government in general, or at least the, non, the discretionary parts. So he's talking here about a potential $18 billion shortfall in one year, primarily in operations and maintenance army. Or in other words, let me put this a little differently, training dollars, okay? $18 billion worth of training dollars. That kind of hits, should hit close to home for you because that's where, as junior leaders especially, that's 
your money. That's the money you're going to live off of. You're not going to be worried about buying equipment, expensive equipment. You're going to not be worried about paying your soldiers. That's all taken care of. It's all really about the training resources. So this was going to actually pretty be a pretty big deal. Um, and then I just want to read a little bit of this next paragraph because I think it's very relevant, just as relevant is today as it was back in 2013. Uh, he says, our attention here at Washington is going to be dealing with the fiscal situation and the difficult decisions that remain as we shape our force and we need you to remain focused on the fundamentals. Okay, here we go. So what are the fundamentals? Develop your soldiers. Okay, that's your charge, to develop your soldiers. That's your number one priority. And then he talks a little bit about civilians because this is for the entire Army. And then developing your future leaders, conduct a good, being a good steward of your resources. No matter what level you're at, you're going to have resources. And by the way, that's not just money. Your resources are your time. In fact, I'd argue that that's probably, as a junior leader, that's your number one resource is time. Uh, sustaining high levels of d'esprit dis uh, de corps. And your top priority is to ensure that your force, the force remains uh, available to defend the homeland. And then, of course, he talks about Afghanistan, uh, which isn't an issue in the morning, <laughs> and Korea. And then those that are going to be deploying in the days ahead, because at this time, we were still going to be deploying for several more years. And we recognize that, here we go, along the, along, that along with risks to readiness, seek restoration is also going to bring hardship to the civilian force. So then he goes on and talks about a few other things. But the point here is the senior leadership had a lot of decisions that they had to make about what was going to get cut and what was not. Tough decisions. And, you know, it's no different whether you're, an old, uh, whether you're a four-star general and you've got billions of dollars that you're trying to manage or if you're a second lieutenant and you've got a unit, a few soldiers, it's the same issue, same problem. You don't have enough time, money to do everything. So you have to figure out what it is you're going to do. So how are you going to figure out what to prioritize? Well, the answer is you go back to what's your mission, what's your purpose, what is the reason that you are here, why are your soldiers here? And I just challenge you to do that um, because, again, it probably your arguably your cha biggest challenge is going to be time. You just can't train on everything. We don't have enough time to do everything, so you're going to have that's probably your arguably your difficult challenge. Now, as you can probably imagine, uh, this is going beyond just the military and budgets and budget cuts and all this stuff because I think there's also, especially for you guys, a very sp important spiritual application as well. Uh, you know, there was somebody that approached our Lord Jesus Christ with a question uh, about what was the greatest commandment. I mean, he's, he's probably thinking, you know, the Old Testament, all the different commandments and all the different things that the Israelites were charged to do. Well, what's the most important? And, of course, what's Christ's answer? In a way that only he is God, very God, could answer. <laughs> uh, keep the first things first, right? Uh, Jesus answered and said to him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. And the first, this is the first and great commandment. And they didn't stop there, did he? He said, And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And I think that's really critical, especially for a Christian in the military, is that you keep that in mind. Again, there's going to be a lot of demanding requirements from you, uh, both in terms of your time, your attention, your energy. And there's going to be temptations. There are going to be things that come up. And to be successful as a Christian leader, no matter where you're at, uh, I think it's just critical that you go back to what is your purpose? What is your primary purpose and mission in life? <laughs> Certainly, you have to keep in mind what your mission of your unit is. But I'd say even uh, more important than that is what is your mission and purpose as a follower of Christ. So I challenge you and charge you as uh, you go forth and you're a leader in the military at whatever level God allows you to have, that you keep the Lord first in all your relationships, in your walk with him, in your family, personal life, uh, in your church for sure. I just hope and I trust that you'll continue to be faithful in serving uh, even if you get deployed all over the place. I know there's good churches in Hawaii, by the way, you know. <laughs> and that you do so even in your units is God gives you opportunity to be a good leader there as well and a follower of Christ. So uh, I love our little phrase that we have in Maranatha. Uh, three short little words that say are so much is packed with uh, so much meaning. Go and serve and lead. All right, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Foster. Cadets, please rise and move into position as Lieutenant Colonel Johnson will now administer the oath of office.
Thank you, Lieutenant Colonel Johnson. At this time, Captain Menz will now administer the Wisconsin Guard Oath to Second Lieutenant Abbey. of the Army National Guard of the State of Wisconsin. Of the Army National Guard of the State of Wisconsin. So help me God, so help me God.
salute can be traced back to the Middle Ages when travelers held their open hands up in order to indicate that they had no weapons in their possession capable of injuring others. It also dates back to medieval times and the knights who wore suits of armor that included a helmet and visor. When two knights riding horses met, they would raise their visors to expose their faces for recognition. If recognized as friends, they would leave their visors up and drop their hands. This was always done with the right hand since the left hand was used to hold the reins of the horse. This salute further evolved during the time of free men serving as soldiers. In Europe, began carrying their weapons. When these soldiers met, they would raise their right hand to show that they held no weapon and that the meeting was a friendly one. The first salute is a time-honored tradition that demonstrates the mutual respect between a newly commissioned officer and a non-commissioned officer or enlisted service member who has been influential in the development of that officer. The first salute culminates with the passing of a silver dollar from the officer to the non-commissioned officer. At this time, we will conduct the tradition of the first salute. I'd like to ask the individuals conducting the first salute, please make your way up to the front and render honors. Please 
rise for the benediction by Dr. Dross and the playing of the army song. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day, we thank you for these men and the willingness to serve and follow you in service to their country. We pray that you watch over and protect them as they now attest to their willingness to go where they are. Be with them as they move on from here and go on to develop into the best officers they can become. Watch over their training and development and grant them courage and wisdom to lead as officers in the United States Army and National Guard. Send them mentors who will encourage and support them as they grow, challenging them to serve you, their country, and their family, friends, and loved ones as the godly men you have called them to become. Help us to pray for them and for their continued growth and protection. Help them to excel as officers and leaders in their professional and private lives, to be examples of dedication and integrity, and to serve as effective and compassionate servant leaders everywhere they go. Sustain them in their relationships, during the good times and the bad, through whatever you allow their way. Watch over them closely, we pray, and draw them closer to you in every way, so that at the end of their lives, when they see your face, they will hear those wonderful words from you, well done, thou good and faithful servant. We ask all of this in the name of our Christ and Lord. Amen.